Imagine the scenario, I've got a machine, supposed to be a web server. I'm playing the part of a junior admin and I accidentally deleted the web root. The senior admin says there's a backup. Hold on, I select the right window. I've got this web backup. We're gonna extract the web backup. Okay, we're gonna do it verbose so we can tell what's going on. It's a gzip file, so we need to add a Z. We're gonna preserve the original file locations and we're gonna tell it what file we're gonna use and that's this web backup right here. So we're gonna extract that. You can see there's a lot of stuff in there that I didn't expect. That doesn't look good. Hey, that's really neat. Where did you get this tar archive? Uh, well, someone gave it to me. They said this is the backup, so I restored the backup. Was it on the same operating system that you're running? No, it came from our last web server. So it was like, well, we recently went through a migration, right? And I was tasked with trying to get the web server up and running. So I yeah. see what you have on the screen there. That and doesn't look good. You added back VM Linux 310, right? That doesn't sound happy. Let's try to start up the web server. Oh, error while loading shared libraries, libgcrypt. That oh, doesn't yeah. sound good, does it? All right. Yeah. You know what? Let's uh, here, let me clear the screen so we can see what's going on. And then I got to scroll up. I'm telling you this web console thing. Uh, reboot. Oh, man. All right. I think I've broken this machine. You know what? Let's, for good measure, just reboot it. I think you're going to be very unhappy with that reboot. Oh, yeah. That's not good. Scott, I hope you have a demo prepared because I think I just cooked my lab machine. As, as luck would have it, I do have a lab prepared. Always be prepared, right? It's disasters, right? What happens when you're, you just disastrously destroyed your machine? You got to have a backup plan. All right, so Nate, I think one of the problems that you encountered was that when the tar archive was created, it preserved the path names of the files. So when you unbundled it in your on your machine, it actually overwrote files all over your box. And so we talked before the show, and you'd made a tar archive of that as a rel seven box. Yes, and it overwrote all of these files on your rel nine box with rel seven stuff that old libcrypt library should have been rel9 libcrypt library but now it's a rel7 libcrypt library which is like badness not good <laughs> normally a web root backup wouldn't include boot and wouldn't include whatever so it's a little contrived but you know what it can happen right if you're doing a full system backup and carelessly restore the entire backup that can be a problem yeah don't preserve original paths it's a bad bad move i noticed you did a couple other things too there's rules of backup safety Look at the backup before you restore it to make sure that you know right. it's in there. <laughs> Let's do a little bit of like entry level tar stuff. And then we could talk more about strategy. I know that Nate, you have a demo today on automating your backups. And then we're going to talk about other backup tools. But why don't we start with tar? Because that's like the universal backup tool across all uh, Unixes and Linuxes. Before I start, I will say, as we're talking about backups, if your company or organization has a backup utility that has a Linux client, and that's their standard tool that they use for their stuff, you should use that. Um, yeah. A whole lot of partners that Red Hat works with to help support things on for additional software like NetBack and well, Storage Manager, and like lots. But that means that you can plug into the existing policies, procedures, types of backups, disaster recovery plans that the other people in your organization use that also use this client so that you can have similar strategies as the Windows machine team or somebody else in the organization, right? So TAR is the ubiquitous. It exists on all Unixes and Linuxes, and we'll start with that. But if there's another tool that is already in use where you work, that should be your primary target. Nate, you wanted to make a backup of your web route, right? So Yeah, yeah, that was the goal. That was the goal. Yeah, create a backup or a TAR archive. Verbosely, tell me what you're putting into it. And tar is tape archive. So instead of using a tape, I want you to put all this backup stuff into a file. And I'm going to call That's that a file. Weird idea. I know. Big backup tar. Are people right. still using right. tapes? I'm curious. There are people that still use tapes. Huh. And we'll just do Etsy HTTPD. All right. So we're just going to grab the Etsy stuff out of HTTPD. And there we go. That's all the stuff that was pulled in. Now you'll notice when I ran it, you may not have seen this little tiny thing right here. Removing this is the problem is. that Nate had earlier. So <laughs> while it pulled all of these files in, if I do a tar tf, 
the table of contents from the file config backup dot tar right notice that leading slash is not there yep okay yep. and uh, i i did actually try some things with the quote unquote bad archive if you tried to extract it in a directory other than root and did not include the p flag when you extracted it it still didn't destroy everything you had to include p the preserve the preserve uh, flag i challenge that assertion and it didn't break my system and it, it extracted inside of the directory that i was in i now i would still be careful right but it's not as easy to do as as i may have led into in my demo i think it determ is determined by that capital p flag and we'll talk about that in a second right all right so i just took my config backup tar and put it in temp right there it is right there and when i extract from it tar x pf extract tell me what you're pulling out and I'm going to give you a file name. It unbundles it locally. And so now I have this Etsy subdirectory in my temp directory. Mm -hmm. And in there is that HTTP directory that I copied. And then there's all the actual stuff for my, for my backup. So whenever you use a, a tar archive, I always like to take a quick look with tar TF. Yeah. So it'll show me what's in there and then you can extract it. And here we go. Nate, did you know that you could also extract individual files? I was aware of that. I don't really do it that often though. So if you do a tar extract verbosely file fig backup.tar, and then you tell it, I want Etsy HTTP HTTP D.conf. Oh, hold on. I put on the slash. It just pulls out this one file. Now it'll actually create the entire directory structure. So let me, let me do it one more time. Man, Typo. I'm not doing good with typing today. All right? There's one directory underneath. There's one directory underneath that. And there's one file in there, right? Because when I extracted it, I said, pull out this one file. And so it recreates the directory structure down to that one file and pulls it out. So that's a way that once you do it, table of contents listing, if you don't want everything, you just want that one thing, you can just pull that one thing or that one directory out that has several files in it instead of restoring the whole thing. And that might be really useful if you're dealing with really large backups because you don't want to dedicate all the local file system space for storing the entire archive to be restored. All right, let's talk for a moment about dash P. All right, so when you create a tar archive, and I'll just recall my previous command from history. If you include the P option, notice this time it didn't give me that nice error message that it's removing the forward slash from my archive, which means if I do a tar TF on that archive, it stored the files with their fully qualified path name. Yep. So before, without that, that leading slash, it created a Etsy directory, my current working directory, and then everything was undone underneath that locally created Etsy directory. But now in my archive, I actually say that all of these files are slash something. We're giving the absolute path thing, which means when I untar it, it's going to spray them around in the directory structure, overwriting all the files that are in place before. So that's, uh, that's where dash P is a rough go. Yes, it can be. It sounds like an attractive option because you're like, of course, I want to put the files back where they came from. However, warning bells, make sure that you're not overwriting files that check that table of contents first and make sure there's not files in there that, that you're going to regret overwriting if you're going to use the preserve flag. Yeah. And this is also like a big no-no. There's a reason why the capital P option is not the default and it requires right. an extra option because TAR is used for all kinds of things. Like moving data from one system to another, irregardless of what type of system it is. If I wanted to share with Nate my Apache content and he's running another distribution like Ubuntu, I might still tar it all up and send it to him. But if he then yeah. takes this, this archive and unpacks it on his Ubuntu box, like it's that's not where Ubuntu even puts web content. It can cause a lot of problems if you're not careful with it. There are some valid use cases for it. For example, when you package up a container, or certain types of cloud images and whatnot, they're tar files at their base, right? And that's actually how they get deployed. They go to an empty disk and they untar the thing and it writes out the entire file system as you'd expect it, right? So that's why that option even exists if it's so dangerous. Um, so the other thing I wanna talk about quickly with our tar overview is compression. So when I was creating my tar archive right here, whoops, right there, 
And I'll go ahead and take out the dash P option. You can also, when you're creating it, not only create the Tark archive, but then go ahead and compress it as well. And there are two yep. options that handle compression. One is the Z option that uses gzip compression, which is the Lempel Zev. Whoops, hold on. I, let me do that one more time. Let's see. I want to make the other one and I need to also change its extension so that people know that it's compressed. Man, there we go. Boom. Why uh, should you type the command if it's somewhere in your history, even if it's a hundred commands back? I wasn't expecting it to be that far back. All right. <laughs> All right. So I have two, right? This was my one that I made originally that was uncompressed. And then here's the one that I made that's compressed. And you can see that it did a pretty good job of compressing it, right? It went from 71K of file storage to 16K, almost 17K of file storage. GZIP compression uses a combination of Lempel-Zev compression algorithm, as well as Huffman coding to try and deduplicate data and other stuff to get you down to this smaller size. If I run file... Uh, it tells me that this is gzip data, right? It actually doesn't know what's inside the gzip because I'd have to ungzip it to be able to tell it that. So that's why we use the extension tgz, or sometimes you'll see .tar.gz, so that people know that it's not only GNU zipped, but it's also a tar archive inside of it. And with extraction, Nate, I noticed you used the z option for extracting. Mm -hmm. Turns out you don't have to do that. Yes, tar is smarter now than it used to be, but it's muscle memory for me at this point. I always use Z and then it's, but this file is a BZIP or an XZ. So and then it doesn't work and I have to remember what the other flag is. However, if I would just leave the flag off, it figures it out and does the, ex, does the extraction. Correct. It sees the tar will actually now natively go, oh, this is GZIP compression. Cool. Let me un-GZIP it and then I'll untar it. And then the other one that Nate mentioned is BZIP2 compression. So if I make my BZ2, and again, I'm changing the extension so that people know how it was created. While tar for us is smart enough to know that you don't have to use the extra option, that may not be true of all Unixes. So there we go. So this TBZ2 is slightly smaller. It uses the Burroughs Williams compression algorithm for doing compression. Both of them do really well on text archives. Right, so all my config files, that was just text. They do really good on that. The BZ2 algorithm, which is Burroughs Wheeler, does pretty good at mixed content. So if you have a mix of binary and text, it'll actually make it smaller. And neither one of them do well with just binary content. So you shouldn't even bother if you're making a tar archive with just binary content. You could, but yeah, you're right. It's just... Why? Just add some more overhead. Well, but you can still tar binary content together so it's in one file, so it's easy to move around. But yeah. but if you actually compress it, sometimes the compressed version is actually bigger. With I've seen that. Content. Depends on the data. So, on the binary data. so, Nate, that's a little bit on tar. 